Um, welcome to Deep Learning with PyTorch session. Um, hope all of you are having a great time attending the conference. Uh, my name is Sachin Sulkin. I uh, work at Fidelity Investments here in the RTP region in uh, NC. Um, uh, I want to just briefly first uh, go over kind of the agenda and the sequence of things that I will be talking and kind of sharing with you. Uh, so first we'll just briefly uh, talk about the PyTorch framework. Uh, what is it? Uh, why PyTorch? Uh, why is, has it become popular? Uh, then we'll uh, dive into the code of um, actually uh, looking at a Jupyter notebook, looking at the PyTorch code of building a neural network. Um, uh, we'll, uh, here we'll build a convolution neural network. Uh, so we'll, we'll walk through that uh, using the Jupyter notebook. Um, and we'll use this uh, convolution neural network for image classification. Uh, given the, the virtual nature of this uh, conference, uh, I, I, I really can't see any of you and it is really weird. I have been presenting at this conference for the last few years and it is always uh, an exciting time uh, in, in this time around in fall. Uh, just, just that energy um, that, that you see at the conference here. Uh, I'm presenting there. It's a little weird right now uh, that you can see me, but I, I don't, I can't see any anybody else and your uh, how you're feeling and how, how things are going. So uh, please feel free, uh, as the moderator said, um, use um, the chat session, the Q&A session. I'll be looking at it often through the presentation. Um, also, we'll try to uh, make it as much interactive as I can. Um, with using the raise your hand uh, feature. So we'll need your help there uh, to, to respond to my questions. Uh, I also need your help to kind of um, disable your raise your hand um, as we are done with that kind of particular question because there is, uh, there's no way for me to kind of disable it for everybody. So need some help there. Uh, and uh, I'm always available to also connect after the session. Uh, my Twitter handle is there and um, uh, on, the on all the slides. And so we can, uh, we can also chat um, via that. So also as a, um, before I get into that, just an obligatory comment um, that all the co content and comments here are mine, not a reflection of um, the place where I work. So just uh, let's uh, get into um, uh, uh, talking about um, uh, PyTorch and uh, before I get into the actual, uh, the basics of our PyTorch, I want to just first share like few tips of my learnings uh, as I learn PyTorch or any of the other uh, deep learning framework. Uh, so we all know that uh, ML is based on like, machine learning is based on linear algebra and probability calculus, but you don't really need to know math. and and. Uh, math is not going to help you choose the different types of algorithms. You, uh, you still have to uh, spend time in uh, exploring and experimenting. There's so much of intuition uh, that goes uh, with uh, creating a deep learning model or any, any machine learning model. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, knowing everything about math is, is not needed. Um, also, some of these things get really very complex. Uh, so you don't need to understand everything at the first go as you're going through the code that we, that we will also see in a few minutes as I walk through the Jupyter notebook. Uh, you really need to, at a high level, understand kind of your, the basics, uh, the input and the results uh, that you see at the end. And then you can then start experimenting by changing certain parameters, et cetera. Um, also, um, Again, it is not very much necessary to know the ins and outs and every detail about the particular algorithm. Um, I think it is more important to know kind of the, the limitations of the algorithms more, uh, really know at a high level which is applicable where, rather than like really understanding the, and deeply understanding the algorithms. Um, and then um, you don't need to understand Python. PyTorch is obviously based on Python. You don't really need to know everything on that. Obviously, if you know that it's easier, but uh, if you know any other programming language, it is good. It is easier. 
um, syntax of Python is very intuitive. Uh, and many of you might have already been working on it, so it might be um, very familiar, but you don't need to uh, really know everything um, or, or all the um, features of Python. And I always like, I want to mention this is because I, I feel um, my journey of learning uh, AI and machine learning and deep learning, you know, I was always hesitant uh, learning more of it. And uh, it was all because of some of these things that were in my mind and were blocking me. But once I started um, just following some of the steps, it was easier for me to learn the frame frameworks and most of these frameworks and 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 how they work are very much similar. So uh, we will we'll talk about PyTorch versus TensorFlow Keras um, and kind of the uh, distinguishing features between them. But again, it is they they follow a very much similar pattern, and you learn one, you um, learn other ones also. So get, getting on to the 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 meat of this uh, session. So what what is Py, PyTorch? Um, uh, I, I think. With seeing so many of you attending this session, I think uh, it is you. You all already know, and that it is one of the most popular deep learning frameworks. Um, it is uh, uh, that is increasingly used by a um, lot of AI researchers. It it has been it was released just um, uh, in 2017, early 2017, and just in three years, it has it has uh, grown a lot in popularity and kind of. Um, matching, trying to match uh, with uh, TensorFlow. So what is PyTorch? Open, open source Python library for deep learning um, uh, developed and maintained by Facebook, um, where popularly used by academics and researchers. That is where, um, where it is getting that popularity and slowly uh, getting into more productionalized um, kind of um, use cases. Um, if I just had this uh, picture of the popularity from the Google search trends, um, you can see that um, the, the blue is the TensorFlow and the, the orange is the PyTorch. And you can see that as we come towards the June of 2020, which is the, like, the last one that I have here, um, it has kind of started matching, uh, at least from the Google search trends. Uh, that definitely is not the only means. Um, of uh, knowing the or, or uh, understand uh, assessing the framework, but it kind of tells you um, a, a story about uh, PyTorch. Uh, it is uh, primarily used for uh, those use cases, those AI machine learning use cases related to computer vision or uh, natural language processing so, um, things. So uh, anything with image processing, image classification, which comes in under computer vision or you are um, um, understanding your um, uh, um, a basic English language text, uh, for example, under natural language processing. Uh, by one of the reasons why it has become popular um, as opposed to the other frameworks is because it is very flexible um, and we'll get into some of it uh, in, in the next slide. But uh, there are um, the the, uh, uh, compared to something like Keras, which is really a very high level kind of uh, framework, um, PyTorch is much more lower level, but not as low level as, for example, TensorFlow. Uh, it, it is really um, has uh, good, very good uh, debugging capabilities. Uh, there are some features called like dynamic graphs and all, which, which makes it uh, much more appealing and flexible, very well documented. Um, Keras, for example, is more suited for um, the, those de um, developers or those who, who want to really just want a plug and play framework. I don't want to, re to know uh, all the details, all the lower level details. Um, but uh, as well, PyTorch uh, it gets into that lower level details and that's the cost you pay as opposed to Keras. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into the comparison between some of the frameworks um, in, in just in, in one of the slides uh, later, uh, I think the next slide. Uh, but just um, more, yeah, just uh, getting on to more about like why PyTorch, right? Uh, so it, it is Python based. Um, uh, it is, uh, you, you'll see it called as very Pythonic. 
um, the, the libraries of PyTorch are similar to NumPy, uh, uh, though they are the PyTorch by default uh, uh, uses tensors, um, uh, but very, very much similar to NumPy and, and very good support available to, uh, to uh, convert into NumPy back and forth. Um, uh, and, and NumPy is, a, the, is one of the very popular packages to, uh, that, that is used he heavily in uh, machine learning algorithms or, or implementing machine learning. Um, um, the PyTorch has many algorithms already implemented. The whole point of all these uh, deep learning frameworks is that they have these algorithms implemented and we'll see how easy it is to uh, just generate a, like a convolution neural network with just a few lines of code. Right? That's the whole advantage, <clears throat> advantage with uh, this frameworks. Um, uh, it, it obviously is a deep learning framework. Uh, it has GPU support um, uh, as opposed to something like if you just want to use Python out of the box and NumPy, it does not have the GPU support. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it supports dynamic computational graphs. So what, what it is it, and as we uh, walk through the convolution neural network kind of uh, just the, the, the flow there, um, you use uh, that I can, I can mention it there also that uh, what happens is that um, in, in, in deep learning, as you are going through uh, your training data set and you're training your, your network, the, the, this, the, the behind the scenes, these frameworks are really um, calculating and creating graphs. And those graphs um, are in, in PyTorch are, are dynamic as opposed to static and for example, in TensorFlow. What that means is that it just gives you more flexibility as a developer to be able to manipulate those, to be able to uh, tweak those, to be able to debug those, uh, it just is much more, and that's where it is, where the flexibility comes uh, with uh, with uh, with this dynamic computational graph. You can, in fact, change the behavior uh, as you run, and and you you can do that without uh, actually incurring much overhead. So again, very very useful when you are are trying to train and you're trying to debug your, um, your, 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 ne your neural network or your machine learning model and uh, you, it will help you create more. It helps you create more uh, sophisticated models uh, with not much, um, much effort. And like uh, most of the frame, um, deep learning popular frameworks, it has cloud support. Um, so all the popular uh, cloud providers uh, provide that. Uh, I'm going to use Kaggle um, and Jupyter Notebook in Kaggle to, to just um, walk through it and, see, and show you how easy it is. But there is um, so many other, in, um, other um, uh, avenues also for you to quickly um, play with PyTorch. And then there is the Open Neural Network um, Association and, and, and kind of uh, it supports that. Uh, so what it means is that you are able to uh, switch between different frameworks easily. Um, because of that support. So before I get into like um, just comparing PyTorch with other frameworks, uh, just wanted to um, just get a general idea of like um, what all frameworks have, have people used, um, machine learning frameworks. If you want to just um, type it in the chat, um, anything that you have played around, uh, any of the machine learning frameworks that you want to share. Keras, uh, good. Any other ones? Yeah, very popular. Google Collab, yeah. I was going to mention Google Collab, <coughs> TensorFlow, Tracks, yeah, all the all the familiar ones. Um, um, also, just by show of hands, um, how many of you are um, um, have? have been have worked with deep learning and have a good uh, really solid understanding of uh, deep learning frameworks and have have created deep learning models um, just show by hands okay kind of few um, yeah around five uh, just probably less than five percent 
uh, how many of you um, have like a kind of a decent understanding uh, of uh, deep learning convolution neural networks? Okay, a little more, probably uh, maybe 10, 12 percent. And how many of you are like very new and uh, uh, are just have probably read about it here and there, but not really do not understand the theory and and kind of just the how how the modeling works. Okay, uh, not, not everybody is raising hands, but uh, I guess probably uh, <clears throat> I will assume the rest of the ones are all new. I'm seeing also the chat posts. I'm looking at different places here, trying to gather information. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, helpful. So that it just helps me as I as I get into it and as I walk through it. Cool. Um, so going to just. Uh, talking about um, the different frameworks and, and comparing it. So I have just the, the three most kind of popular frameworks that I have uh, presented here and I have, uh, um, have picked it up from an article which I have um, referred here at the bottom. So it, it was a very nice kind of um, uh, um, way of comparing it uh, from like at the top, you see the API, which means like, do you have like easy APIs available, which is what like uh, Keras as well as TensorFlow really excel. A PyTorch really don't have that kind of like high level APIs available. Um, Keras code, uh, if you just look at it, you can just, it's like English, you will just know it. Uh, PyTorch, it gets into tensors and all, and it, it is not that easy to read. Um, the, the kind of, use cases that uh, PyTorch is more applicable are really more complex uh, ones uh, where there are a lot of large uh, data sets, you need high performance and all, um, uh, which is the same which, uh, with TensorFlow, which by the way is the most popular and which is more, most you know, the oldest as well as um, uh, where most of the production kind of um, uh, use cases have been deployed. Uh, Keras is obviously plug and play, as I said, so smaller data sets. Um, uh, um, PyTorch, as I mentioned, good debugging capabilities, which is one of the advantages over TensorFlow. Um, uh, it has all, all the frameworks have pre-trained models, so you really even don't even have to train the models. You can just pick it and use it for your use case. Um, it is uh, becoming more and more popular, PyTorch, uh, as we speak. I don't know if it is the third most popular or the uh, second most uh, popular um, uh, performance is high. Uh, and uh, the basic it is language that is written as, is in Lua, but um, it, it, it is exposed as Python and you use Python to write it. So it just this, I, I really like this table because it kind of just tells you where PyTorch fits with respect to all the other popular frameworks that are there. And it's going to play out, it's going to evolve. And as, as, we, as we are seeing in the last couple of years, uh, most of the, frameworks adopt the best practices and the most uh, liked uh, features of the other frameworks. And within probably six months to a year, you have other frameworks also catching up, uh, which I think TensorFlow has now the, the dynamic graph um, facility uh, feature. Uh, we, earlier it was a study graph, but now it has the dynamic graph also. Okay, so um, now um, get into the the actual code and and building the neural network. Um, so deep learning, <clears throat> um, like, like any other machine learning uh, building model, classic different steps uh, from preparing the data, defining the model, training, evaluating, and then actually testing the model and making the productions, right? So uh, I like uh, to always think it that way. I like to, um, organize my uh, code and my Jupyter notebook also similarly that way. Uh, and I have tried to organize the notebook that which I'm going to share with you in a minute. Uh, that, that way it is very clear and very easy to uh, understand and obviously easy to share with um, your other um, coworkers that you would be working on for building this model. Any, any questions before I move ahead and start um, sharing the code?
Okay, I will move on. So Jupyter Notebook. Um, so we, uh, as I mentioned that I'm going to, I uh, hosted it on Kaggle and Kaggle provides GPU support. Um, somebody on the chat also mentioned about Google Colab, uh, another tool that is available. Um, it is very easy. You can obviously use other, the cloud providers also, but this is just very simple plug and play any of these uh, tools uh, that are available online. You don't need to install anything on your local machine and all to try it just to try out certain things. And, and then you get free GPU uh, to train your models, um, which obviously makes uh, training your models based obviously based on data set, but data set, but it helps you train your models um, uh, in few minutes as opposed to hours if you um, use CPU. And as, as I said, right, obviously depends on the size of the data set. So, um, um, so I'll, I'm going to stop sharing this and then go to um, go and share the Jupyter Notebook. So give me a second. Okay, I think you all should see uh, the the browser and the notebook here. So um, some of the things here, and this is as I, as I mentioned, is on Kaggle. So let me um, just show you certain things here. So um, you uh, have set it uh, for Python. I have put in as accelerator as uh, to your GPU. It gives you some minimum number of hours. Um, uh, that's the quota that you're available over a certain number of days, um, uh, 42 hours. Uh, and then there are certain other things that you need to um, enable for the code to run. Uh, and th there is, um, uh, this is all available under, under, under the settings. So if you have a Kaggle account, you can, you, you might already know, or you, you can go and uh, check out. Um, and here is where you can kind of change it um, to whether you use CPU whether G or you use GPU or even go to TPU. Um, it shows also the folders at the top, the input and the output folder. Um, okay. So I have already, um, just in interest of time, I have gone, I've gone through and run this notebook. So you, uh, I'll use that to talk through the, uh, the output. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, talk through those five different steps that I uh, showed you. Uh, and for a, a, any machine learning model uh, or any a, uh, anytime you're, you're, you're building a model, uh, as, as you know, right, the first and the foremost step is um, getting your um, data set ready. And uh, that is the most time consuming time. That's the most time that I have spent. Um, I'm just looking at, was there a question? Okay, if you have a question, please uh, type in. Um, so, um, so what with the, for this particular example, what we are going to do is that we are going to use a, um, uh, a, uh, CIFAR, uh, 10, uh, 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 data set that is already available. It's from the, uh, Canadian, Canadian Institute, uh, and it, they have kind of tagged, uh, millions of images, um, of different objects and CIFAR 10. Is a, is a small subset of that. Um, it has, uh, the 10 stands for the 10, um, uh, the 10 kind of classification. So we, we are going to use those images and use a convolution network to classify, right? So this is the CIFAR uh, 10 data set. You can see that uh, they're all in PNG format. Um, there is, um, they are, these are the, on the left-hand side are the, the 10 kind of uh, classification. So given, uh, so we are going to train our CNN to uh, use this data set, uh, which is around like 50, 60,000, uh, 10, uh, 5,000 images of each of these uh, 
five to six thousand of each of these um, uh, objects, and then given any object, you should be able to find out. Um, yeah, it should be able to detect uh, whether it's a airplane or a horse, for example. So I already downloaded the data from the the, the website, and it's in the zip file, and I will unzip it. Uh, so first step is uh, preparing the data. Um, and as I mentioned, right, there are like um, uh, 50,000 uh, to um, 60,000 images, 50,000 are in the train and 10,000 in the uh, test region. So their, their data set has two main folders, train and uh, test. So uh, this is all about extracting the data. And then I'm, uh, because my here output is for, for whatever reason, it is just, uh, spinning here. So I thought, let me just print out what are these and you can see all the different uh, kind of the files uh, that are there. Uh, and then I had to play around to kind of just move some of the files and make some directories and all. None of that is really important in this context, just a lot of code um, to just uh, make sure that I have everything kind of set properly. And I'm just going to keep scrolling through those. So I now have, uh, Till now, I have all the I have put in the training images in the right places, and I just wanted to check, hey, like how many images are there for each one of them? So as I mentioned, total fifty thousand images, five thousand images of each one of them in the training data set. Same thing I do with the test, um, and again, not any important code here. And the same thing that I uh, print out, and uh, I have like a thousand images for, again, each of those in the test data set. Okay, so it's all about just um, just getting the data in the right folders. Uh, now it is in the right folders. Uh, now we are using now all the Py PyTorch um, uh, features and frame uh, the framework, what it, uh, the frame, PyTorch framework uh, packages that it offers. One of them is a Torch version, which is used for these kind of computer vision, image classification kind of problems, it, it provides a lot of uh, cool utilities to load the images, uh, convert it into tensor, etc. And just checking for the chat. Okay, no questions. So um, all the, um, so this kind of year, you kind of load your training data set, um, all the images into, into this data set variable, and then uh, every time you kind of, before you start really getting into the depth of it, uh, into, into like creating the models and all, make it uh, just understand what is going on in, in, in the data set, play around with it and look at it. So that's what I, I'm doing here, understanding what are these uh, data sets. They are 32 by 32 pixel images. Um, and the, the three stands for the channels for the red, green, blue, RGB, as you know, in every image, ultimately it's a major, uh, matrix um, and, and those are the three levels of mat matrices for um, each standing for the red, green and blue because this is a color image and I kind of just print out it. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the default is all a tensor. Again, nothing really to understand here. I'm just really looking at it and confirming my understanding of this, uh, this data set. Uh, and then just again, if I look at it, just plotting it using the matplotlib and just seeing, hey, what is it? Uh, this is aeroplane. And you can see that this data set is not really that uh, easy, uh, that it has, uh, th this is not that something has happened with the resolution on my machine. It is this image, it is blurred because you are really um, trying to uh, train the model you know, and create a model uh, to really understand like real world images, which are not going to be all nice and crisp, right? So you can see the airplane, like you can really just see, um, barely you can see another another image. Again, just, just understanding it. Now getting into like splitting the data sets, right? One of the most important uh, step um, is creating the training and valid validation set. And usually 90, 10% uh, you do, um, 95, 90% um, uh, uh, for your training, 10% for your uh, validation. So you use your training, uh, your uh, uh, data set, and you split it so that as you 
um, build your model and you start um, uh, training it, you have some validation um, that happens along with that uh, so that you kind of understand how your model is performing uh, and whether it is really performing good, uh, how much accuracy it has before you apply it on a test uh, data set. So you split it 90 to 10%, so 45,000 for um, your training and 5,000 for your validation data set. And um, one of the things, um, another uh, important things that you usually do building this uh, models is that you use uh, the concept of batches. So you, you create from your, your data set, the training data set, you create uh, different batches and I'm saying create 128 batches uh, or, or a batch size, each batch size of 128. So for whatever 5,000 divided by 128 would be the number of batches. And, and that you do is um, just so that um, it is more efficient and you don't have too many things that you're holding in the memory. Um, so when you're work, trying to train millions of images, you don't want to load everything at the same time, you put it in batches and kind of load it. So that's what is happening here. Um, there's a question. So, um, so the question is, can you please explain how defining model depending on the prepared uh, data set? So um, i trying to understand more context, but it, it is not uh, the, uh, the defining the model. If you are like, I'm going to go there in, in just a few minutes of like convolution neural network and it is not going to be um, uh, depending on the, the data set. I think it is very uh, calm. It is the same for um, any type of um, neural network that you're defining. So just going through uh, this and seeing the batches. Okay, this is my batch of 128 and you see all the different types of images. It's all randomized. Uh, you, uh, you want to randomize that. Um, and then now you start getting into the defining the CNN and the convolution neural network, right? So, and you can see um, the different steps in the convolution neural network. And I know uh, not everybody is familiar with it. So I'm going to uh, be, uh, like try as my best in the next 10, 15 minutes, 15 minutes that I have to go through it. I, I think it is more very important to kind of know at a high level, uh, but it is, once you know it, it is very intuitive and um, you really don't need to um, you, 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 um, it, it, uh, it, uh, once you understand it intuitively, it is very easy to then work with the code. So first step is, there are three steps in the convolution neural network. First is what is called the convolution, right? So this is really, um, I, I have these images uh, that I use, uh, this is kind of um, graphical dynamic images. So it kind of shows you how um, you have a, a you can think of this as an image, which is just nothing but pixel, uh, different pixel values. And then you kind of move a slider, uh, the three by three slider the, represented by kind of um, yellow color that is sliding on it and you find the result. What in real world, what that means when it does is that it is really, what it is doing is it is, uh, what it is trying to detect is the features of that image. The features of the image could be the edge of an image, uh, that maybe there are curves in the image, um, all, all those things that kind of make that image, um, there might be some ellipt elliptical shape in it. That is what these uh, convolutions do. And that you kind of, what it helps is you kind of start understanding what this image consists of. So in real world, uh, if I look at this, you can see that um, there is uh, this, a kind of a downtown image and you have a slider here, which if you can see the red one is kind of um, showing you one edge, one tilted edge and the green one kind of the other tilted edge. And as it goes over, it is really understanding um, those, the, 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 those kind of um, vertical lines uh, in the image. So you can see the resultant image, you are only seeing that those vertical lines and, and not other things. So what it is trying, what it is helping you to do is that uh, in, in mathematical terms and for, and for your computer and for your GPU, it is just helping you to um, um, really understand image in terms of its uh, spatial uh, kind of configuration and kind of relationship. So, um, 
So if I move to the next step, um, and um, this is just another, I'm just playing with the code and seeing how can I apply this kind of convolution and see what the printout is again, not um, nothing much to understand there. Here, um, <clears throat> the second um, other steps in, in convolution is something called rectified uh, linear unit or ReLU, right? So it, what it is, it, is, it brings the uh, non-linearity into CNN in, in the network, right? So what it does is that all negative values that you get from the calculations uh, from your convolutions, you uh, use ReLU function and anything that is negative, you make it zero. Uh, anything that is positive, you keep it. And, and what it is, it is just bringing, brings in the non-linearity because if you, uh, if you don't do that, then you, what basically you are saying is that uh, you, you're telling your model and your, the architecture of your neural network is that everything is linear. Your, what your, your input is the given and the output, there is a complete linearity from the input to output, which is not always the case, right? So hence um, you had to use something like ReLU. And again, the same thing, um, you can see that um, whatever is the, the negative is, is removed after ReLU and you only see the non-negative and you can see how it changes and it, it shows the kind of, again, the spatial kind of configuration, but not all the details. Uh, the other thing is called uh, spatial pooling. What that does is, um, again, what, what this is to simplify your model. As you can uh, imagine, you have uh, the 30 by two by 32 pixel, you multiply with the three by three matrices, your three channels, you're going to get large set of numbers across all your data set, right? And you want, it's going to bring in complexity. So can you reduce that complexity? So what it does is that you look at the matrix and you, there are different ways you can just take the max value. So in this case, the max value is six. In this part, the max value is eight, three, four, et cetera. You can even take the average. Uh, what it is doing is that it, you're losing some information, but you are still keeping what is the most in, in, in max, uh, case max pooling, you uh, strategy if you use, you keep still keeping the 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 top the the main kind of uh, value there. So if something is more darker, you are going to probably in the image you are going to keep that rather than everything. So um, again, the same feature. If you look at this after you're done the ReLU, you do the max, or if you just did the average, um, you can see what uh, pixels you gather. And, and all of this is again, just to be able to make it simpler and easier for your calculations. Um, the fully connected uh, layer or what it is called as part of the CNN architecture is really um, the, you, you have all these now high level features that you have calculated using your convolution max the neural network. So if it is an image of a, of a dog, you kind of know, uh, or of a cat, you know there is there are some whiskers, there is a, a particular type of nose and eyes, and you kind of uh, have that spatial understanding of it. Now you're trying to connect it all together to kind of recognize, okay, this is a cat versus, hey, if this is kind of the spatial relationship, then this is a dog. And that's kind of what is called the fully um, uh, trained connector network. Uh, there are other concepts like dropout and all which uh, uh, which gets into something called overfitting and all. Uh, if I get time, I'll, I'll get into it, but I want to start showing some code here. Um, I'm just checking if there's a... Okay. Um, so the code, uh, you can see it. Um, I'm uh, instantiating a neural network and I'm creating now a... a Say I'm using object-oriented programming here, defining some classes for kind of validating and all those things, just some helper functions. But um, here is where is the class where I'm defining my convolution neural network. What you see here is your convolution network. So what are 10, 15 lines of code is, is CNN. And so very easy to instantiate it. Uh, and you can see that there are multiple layers. So each convolution network uh, convolution, what you see is the CON2D is, is one of the layers. And so what you do is that you kind of keep 
going through these different layers uh, and intuitively or at a, at a high abstraction level, what that means is that you really, each time you're passing your, um, tra your data set through that um, convolution, you are identifying different features. So the first, uh, when you pass through it, you're probably maybe identifying, hey, are there like vertical edges? Hey, um, when you pass it again, you're going to, okay, I think um, I know kind of the vertical and horizontal edges. I want to see, uh, are there curves here? Um, uh, are there some other kind of uh, slanted lines and all those, like I, I'm, I'm talking in terms of images. Uh, and that is what each uh, of this convolution net network does. And you're, you're going to the same step, go to the convolution network, make it non-linear using ReLU. You do your max pooling to reduce your complexity. And you can see that the, the size of it uh, size of it keeps increasing. Uh, the, it, it goes decreasing, but its size of it keeps, uh, uh, the number of layers keeps increasing. Hey, um, anybody wanted to mention anything? Okay, so that is it. And then you um, uh, kind of then uh, tie it all together here, the, the fully connected network, the 10 years stands for like the 10 um, different data sets that you have. Uh, you instantiate the model uh, here. That this is this is the my class here, which I have defined, right? Um, and so I instantiate it, um, and I just check what it uh, print it out, and it's the same thing that we just saw. Um, and then I pass it pass my training. Um, my, um, I train it, uh, and here is where I'm going through the different uh, images. I'm confirming that I have my GPU is set. I just have some default code for that just to confirm that and say, says that I have my uh, GPU here um, and um, I then start actually uh, training the model um, using, by calling the train feature and then looking at the losses that the model has for each of the batch uh, and then um, go and update uh, the the values uh, that 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 are used in the convolution neural network, the matrices that you see in the convolution, it starts with some default like one zero 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 one zero, and then it will keep updating it uh, as it tries to optimize um, to to the the actual um, uh, thing, the image that we are trying to identify, uh, and we are we are using this um, the gradient descent. Again, don't have time to go through that, but it's a classic way uh, to optimize a machine learning model. Um, and once I have now uh, tra trained it and I'm evaluating it, um, I have, uh, sorry, I'm not yet trained it. I've just defined it at the top um, without just training, just by default values, I have like um, just 9% accuracy. Here. So one in 10 in times it will identify, but then I um, train it, um, the model, uh, and the uh, epoch, uh, uh, the number of epochs is 10. Each epoch means it is going through the whole training data set, every epoch. Um, uh, so it goes through one data, the whole training data set, um, modifying the values. The accuracy is, has jumped you know, just from 10% now to 48%. <clears throat> We adjust the values, it keeps on jumping and you go through that so multiple times. And, and th there is no set value uh, for Epic. It is really, uh, you really need to play around with it. You can see here that at around like nine or 10, it is already uh, at max 70. So that is all we can achieve with this neural network. And I left it at that just to show that you need to play around with it. I kind of. Uh, drew the graph of it that it starts from like very low 10% goes to uh, around 75% and, and, and plateaus there. Um, and here is the training and the validation loss. Uh, so that you can see here, my training loss is continuously decreasing, but my validation, it decreases first and then it kind of plateaus and then starts in fact increasing. Uh, th this is what is called really underfitting, which means what it is telling is that my model is good for my training data set, but it is not good for my validation data set. And I need to continue to uh, make it better. Uh, and then I just test it with some different, uh, just try it out. And I tried with some 
and then uh, one of them for horse, it is predicting as an airplane. Again, it is only 75% accurate, so it's never it will not be accurate for everything. But anyway, I, I kind of <clears throat> went through the last section in the last 10, 15 minutes, but I hope I gave you enough um, idea about uh, PyTorch, how it is used, uh, and how easy it is for you to play around with the available data sets. And just within a few lines of code, you are able to build a net neural network and able to uh, start predicting. So that's all I have um, given the time. Um, uh, so I'm just looking at the questions. Uh, so one of the questions here is, uh, how do you decide which all functions like ReLU fully can like, need to use? Um, uh, so Anantram, so that uh, is the standard uh, convolution neural network architecture. So as part of neural network, this is that's what I showed you that those 10 lines and the different layers, that is the default. So you'll always use that whenever you are using a deep learning uh, network. Without that, you will not even get even if, uh, even, uh, uh, even a few percentage accuracy. Uh, even the 10% we saw, you will not even get that. 